Okay, well, uh, thank you, first of all, to Professor Zimmerman for having me today. Thank you for those of you uh, who are joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Clark Elliston. I teach at Shrine University uh, in a brisk, but at least sunny rural Texas. Uh, and today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend uh, the lion's share of our time uh, presenting some adapted material from uh, some work that I've done on the concept of work, and particularly in relation to the concept of human flourishing. And so uh, it's adapted insofar as I, I took out a good portion of the uh, introductory material. So by way of explanation, we're going to begin with uh, the concept of total work as leading to despair. Uh, and so where we're going to pick up is where this despair comes from and some of the, the potential problems that it uh, gives people in a contemporary context. Uh, and then particularly, we're going to look at friendship uh, as a very uh, specific site of uh, a, a place of resistance almost against the, the kind of encroachment of a world of total work. So without further ado, I'm going to begin. I've also asked for those of you that are in the class uh, for Kathy to circulate a link to the text itself. So if you happen to get really bored and you need something to follow along with, feel free. Uh, also, the notes are included. So if you have questions about uh, where some of my claims are coming from, then feel free to, to double check that as well. So I look forward to some discussion afterwards, uh, but without that, let's begin. So the Western cultural despair regarding work appears both positively and negatively. Negatively, one's work provides a key source for the pain and oppression that one experiences in life. Disappointed personal dreams, forced obligations and commitments, and even toxic interpersonal relationships characterize many cultural depictions of work. Uh, in some, we, we think of work culturally as a, as a key negative in most people's lives. Positively, the ideal work is one in which one's deepest desires for meaning are satisfied uh, and in which one receives considerable remuneration, hopefully. Yet this apparent positivity disguises a deeper malaise. Meaningful work, for its part, finds value insofar as it transmutes the drudgery of work into something entirely enjoyable. And so we might consider the spectacularly naive adage, whoever loves what they do will never work a day in their life. The power of meaningful work is that it makes work something other than toil entirely. And yet there is no work that precludes toil. All work as work requires workers to participate in activities which may not be preferable or useful to the worker. Moreover, in even the best work, there are obstacles in the form of other persons and institutions. Pursuing lucrative work equally poses difficulties. Ample evidence suggests that the higher income, once above a certain level securing the basic necessities of life, contributes little to self-reported uh, happiness. What then accounts for the power of wealth to justify its outsized influence on our work decisions? The power of wealth lies in its promise to free one from the sustaining necessities of life. In other words, wealth buys freedom. Paradoxically, one seeks wealth through work so that they have the freedom to reject work or not work. And so either option, work as meaning or work as wealth, ultimately yields despair. The worker for meaning discovers that what is sought does not exist in any kind of pure or idealized form, free from the admixture of enjoyment and toil. Or they discover that work entirely divorced from earning cannot subsidize their passion. Uh, that is, we may love working for a nonprofit and find, us, find ourselves unable to simply pay bills. The worker for wealth discovers that in the course of their work, they have come to identify with the work or they discover that working for wealth gave them a freedom worse than the constraints of a job. Despair characterizes both workers due to the formative power of their commitments. To mistake work for human good and to recognize the mistake possesses serious consequence. And yet distraction mitigates the force of this despair and thus holds a privileged place in our Western techno culture. More insidiously, distraction passes for leisure and thus something intrinsic to human flourishing is replaced by a parody. What modern technological distractions share is a commitment to a reality which supersedes reality. They comprise a hyper-real space in which human experience is distilled into powerful but ultimately illusory appearances. 
Addressing the exchange of meaning for appearance, Jean Baudrillard writes, quote, there is no more hope for meaning. And without a doubt, this is a good thing. Meaning is mortal. But that on which it has imposed its ephemeral reign, what it hopes to liquidate in order to impose the reign of the enlightenment, that is appearances, they are immortal, invulnerable to the nihilism of meaning or of non-meaning itself. This is where the seduction begins, end quote. Pornography serves as a prime example of such hyper-reality. The human sexual experience, while unquestionably good within an order of relations, also requires vulnerability, awkwardness, reciprocity, and the openness of embodiment. Yet pornography distills the sexual experience down to sheer pleasurable aspects of stimulation and even domination. Additionally, pornography intensifies the sexual encounter, magnifying the experience such that it overwhelms the senses. The resulting product for consumption resembles actual human sexuality little, if at all. Actors perform roles without any relational component, with synthetic and modified bodies, with artificial camera angles and sounds, and for an audience they will likely never know. Though pornography exemplifies the seductive allure of the hyperreal, social media occupies a hyperreal space in more mundane ways. Social media's distracting power remains evident to anyone who observes people scrolling absentmindedly through a smartphone. One might, might object that social media initiates social change for good and thus does more than simply distract. And yet problematically, the very context of social media militates against the sorts of discussions that actually facilitate social change. Social media campaigns offer hyperreal imitations of the hard work necessary for considering complex issues with diverse constituents. Limited space and time for persuasion, the ability to mute voices in the discussion, and the limited accountability of online communities all subvert social media's power to influence persons in lasting ways. Consequently, social media tirades serve only to give the appearance of securing good rather than securing the good itself. And indeed, most viewers of social media exist voyeuristically to the posted material. We are the consummate consumers waiting to ingest the lives of others for our pleasure with little to no involvement in the actual narrative itself. And so as pornography parodies sexuality, so social media parodies civic discourse. Leisure, however, opposes this technological obsession with hyperreal distraction. Genuine leisure involves the embodied person in the present reality with its attendant, attendant awkwardness, frustration, and joy. Yet beyond embodiment, three aspects of leisure stand out. First, the receptive character of leisure, and second, a generous aspect of leisure, and thirdly, the humility involved in genuine leisure. And so outlining these concepts in brief, and their relation with one another will then allow for a deeper consideration of friendship uh, in the final section as this, uh, again, circle or this space for resistance. On the way there, we'll consider Joseph Pieper's leisure the basis, basis of culture because it continues to be a crucial resource for discussions of work, leisure, and rest. Pieper's essay, written in 1947, notes that the West already lives under the aegis of a culture of total work. The idea of total work refers to the reality that actual leisure has been overtaken by an impetus towards work as a very specific kind of activity, with the grave consequence that all human life finds its measure in work. And so Pieper observes, quote, now the very fact of this difference of our inability to recover the original of leisure will strike us all the more when we realize how extensively the opposing idea of work has invaded and taken over the whole realm of human action and human existence as a whole. When we realize as well how ready we are to grant all claims made to the person who works, end quote. Two claims above stand out. First, leisure has not simply been forgotten by people who work too hard, in which case reintroduction of leisure could remedy the ill. Rather, the entire concept of leisure has become fundamentally unintelligible. Second, this elevation of work contains within it a social power. By virtue of being a worker, one is granted specific social privilege. Inversely, the non-worker should expect social suspicion. Most problematically, the world of total work makes very key anthropological claims. It is not simply that one chooses to privilege work or leisure, 
but rather that human beings are nothing more than workers. One's value and meaning thus emerges directly from one's work, and a failure to work constitutes something unnatural and even dangerous. In contrast to the world of total work, leisure exists as a receptive activity. The implications for both epistemology and theological anthropology now manifest. Genuine leisure implies a certain posture or orientation before God. Delineating between discursive reasoning or the ratio and the more receptive intuition of the intellectus, while recognizing that proper reasoning involves both, Pieper notes that the intellectus requires a certain reluctance to circumscription. Whereas ratio entails some degree of both possession and mastery, intellectus receives more than it possesses and thus remains the highest human possibility. And so Pieper writes, quote, human knowing has an element of the non-active, purely receptive seeing, which is not there in virtue of our humanity as such, but in virtue of a transcendence over what is human, but which is really the highest fulfillment of what it is to be human and is thus truly human after all, end quote. This account of the interplay between ratio and intellectus, according to Pieper, informs both ancient and medieval conceptions of human knowledge. Thinking is work insofar as it marshals the full power of the whole human intellect. Kant, however, privileges discursive reasoning as the sole locus of intellectual work. And consequently, philosophy as the quintessential human activity becomes identified with the classification, definition, exploration, and mastery of the ratio. Pieper writes again, quote, there is nothing in human knowing that is not the fruit of his own efforts. There is nothing received in it, again, speaking of Kant's uh, notion of ratio, end quote. Moreover, because discursive reasoning is difficult, all proper human knowing is thus difficult. Thinking well is hard work. And yet such arguments conflate effort and quality. Thinking hard is thinking well. That is, if one devotes oneself to, to task of serious thought, to the task of serious thought, then such thinking must be good thinking. The effort put forth becomes the criterion for the thought. Uh, and I cannot help at this point, but uh, think about questions like, can God create a stone that he cannot lift? Um, as an example of a question which seems deceptively uh, serious, but in reality might simply not be that serious. Such industriousness, even in the face of difficulty, seems indicative of true virtue. Yet lost in such an account is the grace and vulnerability inherent in Christian theological anthropology. Denying the given nature of human life closes persons to this reality. Striving to know while negating the receptive aspects of knowledge yields a hardening of oneself against genuine transcendence. And so the endless struggle to understand solely from one's own resources forecloses the possibility of that reciprocal relation. Leisure activity is generous as well as receptive. Pieper frames this insight as liberality or freedom. And so whereas in the past, some persons were set aside for explicitly non-utilitarian uh, purposes, such as monastics and philosophers, total work has abolished that distinction. The world of total work has reformed all members of society as functionaries or cogs within the social machine and thus pushes all to understand themselves as workers towards socially predetermined ends. These ends are external to the self and demarcated according to social utility. Yet as leisure is a state of the soul rather than externally conditioned, it marks the one at home with oneself. This being at home with oneself enables the possibility of celebration and festival. In, celebra in celebration, one joins in with both self and world in affirmation of creation. And Pieper describes it in an almost erotic aspect. Quote, the leisure of man includes within itself a celebratory, approving, lingering gaze of the inner eye on the reality of creation, end quote. And so the generosity born of leisure is thus not productive insofar as it manufactures a new product for commerce or even furthers self-improvement. Rather, leisure generates appreciation for the world and its diversity and wonder. Freed from the strictures of production and social utility, the leisured mind is free both to receive and to give. That human beings are uniquely gifted only multiplies the force of this insight. 
At home with oneself, persons are able to gift others and the world with themselves. And finally, genuine leisure entails humility. This humility is both epistemological as well as ethical. Leisure follows from a stance of soul in which one is open before mystery qua mystery. It does not seek to plumb the depths of that mystery, but is content to allow mystery to be. And here are the relation between activity and non-activity emerges. The leisured self remains active in so, insofar as they attend to the world around themselves. And yet they also steadfastly refuse to impose their will upon that world, to control and to deploy it to their ends. Pieper writes, quote, Leisure is a form of that stillness that is the necessary preparation for accepting reality. Only the person who is still can hear, and whoever is not still cannot hear. Such stillness as this is not the mere soundlessness or dead muteness. It means rather the soul's power as real of responding to the real. A co-respondence eternally established in nature has not yet descended into words. Leisure is the disposition of receptive understanding of contemplative beholding and immersion in the real. Leisure is not the attitude of the one who intervenes, but the one who opens himself. Not of someone who seizes, but one who lets go, and indeed who lets themselves go." End quote. Pieper's insistence on the relation between leisure and reality highlights the gulf between assumptions of leisure as distraction versus a genuine leisure. While the former removes run one from the world, the latter reinvests one into that world. Simone Weil, occupying a similar philosophical space to Pieper, describes this attunement to the world as attention. In attention, the whole self orients towards reality as a place the self is prepared for God. The attentive gaze receives reality as it is, rather than seeking mastery over it. And this impulse to mastery displays only the power of illusion, or more properly, self-delusion. And indeed, only the practice of attending to reality and denying explicitly illusion allows for the eventual realization of the self's nothingness on its own terms, or rather by its own lights. Yet the humility engendered by this attention calls one back into the world into which it exists. And so to be at leisure is to receive from and attend to the world as it is with a reciprocal pouring of oneself back into that world. As a way of entering the world, the humble character of leisure impacts others no less than oneself. This becomes evident once the root of all leisure becomes clear, divine worship. For Pieper, worship denotes that time given over to the divine should, is, is prohibited from any other use. In worship and the accompanying concept of sacrifice, one is given over to God, not as a singular event, but cyclically. Only in this light of self-giving can the rest of life regain its intelligibility. Thus, genuine leisure alone reanimates the self for meaningful work. Giving oneself to God in worship directs, one's, directs oneself to others and the world that those others occupy. And so the posture of worship connects one to God, but also the worshiping community. And so there is not a dyadic relationship with God, but a multiplicity of relations interwoven by with the worship of God. And so here we're going to segue into a conception of friendship and what this looks like um, as, a, uh, as a resistance to the techno, the techno culture of the West. The concept of the friend constitutes a point of resistance to the technological world of total work. To be sure, the benefits of modern technologies are such that a returning to a primitive time prior to their hegemony is neither possible nor desirable. Yet when combined with a culture of total work, modern technologies, and especially social media or new media technologies, level human being down to largely utilitarian relations of preference. The consequences of such leveling have been and will continue to be felt as the inexorable march of innovation advances. Alongside technological advancement comes a deeply felt alienation. And yet there are spaces and relations which, although threatened by modern technologies, hold potential for recovery uh, and thus unique human flourishing. Several features of friendship highlight its power as a quintessential aspect of leisure to reinvigorate our tired technological lives. First, friendship involves both vulnerability and openness. Second, it mandates compassion or presence with another. 
And third, like worship, it draws one into truthfulness and reality. And so examining these aspects of friendship in turn will demonstrate alternative ways of being in a technological world. The selection of friendship as an entry point for theological resistance to an uncritical technological future should seem idiosyncratic, given a relative lack of interest in friendship as a concept within Christian theology. Yet two brief comments should clarify this decision. Most immediately, all positive human relations occur as friendship. Before we make any other distinction, for example, familial, marital, social, or divine friendship, friendship manifests as a simple and gracious invitation to join in a life. More specifically, this invitation, if taken in good faith, extends apart from the utility of the other. One simply enjoys the friend and invites them into their lives. Drawing on this initial insight, friendship most often originates from play, quite literally as children play. Whereas adult friendships may involve aspects of play, children's, ch children's, children base their friendships on play. Thus, even from an early age, the primal stance of human beings is something other than technological, free of circumscription, definition, and mastery. In the child's play, a glimpse of the divine may be found. And overwhelmingly from the child's play comes an invitation to join in, an invitation to friendship. The openness and corresponding vulnerability of friendship serve as first points of resistance to the technological paradigm. If joint play informs friendship, it is a prior openness to an other that makes play possible. The risk inherent in that openness demonstrates an intrinsic acceptance of vulnerability. Paul Waddell observes, quote, there is always an uprooting, a sense of displacement in the beginning stages of friendship. There is often death to one way of thinking and birth to some things we had not considered before. To acknowledge another is to make our world bigger, to open it to surprise. It is impossible to risk such hospitality without feeling the loss of self with an initial sense of disintegration, for that is exactly what happens, end quote. The involvement of another in one's life invites existential danger insofar as the projects and commitments of the other may stifle or conflict with one's own. Perhaps most frighteningly, this vulnerability only expands. The closer one grows to the friend, the greater the pain of betrayal, disappointment, or loss. And thus the deeper friendship becomes, the more vulnerability it requires. To embrace friendship means that one must have the temerity to suffer. These aspects of friendship stand in, star, in sharp relief to the technological mindset com communicated through new media. Because at the heart of the technological lies the hope of mastering the unbidden and especially, or, and especially the potential of danger, it must be restrained at all costs. So friends, quote unquote, may be added or removed with clicks of buttons. The user, user carefully curates what others see and time plays no role. Commitment thus plays a minimal role and the relationship becomes one of sheer preference in the moment. And so friendship within a technological frame privileges the complete agency of the individual who, as we all do, desires the connection of friendship without the cost of vulnerability. And yet smuggled into this conception of friendship is a, co is a commitment to protective self-closure rather than a risky openness to another. And the resulting relationship is unlikely to be friendship or at all or it is cursed to be such an impoverished reflection of friendship as to discredit the name. Aristotle, who devotes a full fifth of the Nicomachean ethics to the topic of friendship, divides friendship into two lower forms, pleasure and utility, and a higher one, a friendship of virtue. While friendships entail enjoyment of another, after all, why would we ever want to endure a friendship? Friendships predicated on pleasure demonstrate a clear deficiency. Namely, such friendships perdure until one party becomes, in, becomes dissatisfied. Problematically, however, this potential dissatisfaction occurs in all relationships across time, given that both circumstances and persons change. No friend, if allowed into a life, will always provide pleasure. Thus, the friendship grounded in pleasure remains destined to either discontinue or retard growth. Similarly, the friendship of utility suffers defect insofar as no relationship involving intimacy always serves one's own interest. To the contrary, genuine friendship necessitates inconvenience as involvement in another's life 
will always bring both pain and inefficiency. Aristotle's third type, the noble friendship, revolves around the cultivation of virtue or a shared orientation toward the moral life. While this model of friendship is not free from ambiguity as well, after all, does one love the friend, actually, or the virtue of the friend? It remains the clearly superior friendship to either pleasure or utility. This superiority follows from the simple awareness of a genuine openness to another person. Under the former conceptions of friendship, the self remains the focus. One seeks the friend due to what the friend offers to the self. And yet for virtue, the self expects another to form oneself in crucial and perhaps painful ways. And this openness to another self and to pain and suffering, inconvenience and inefficiency, demarcates the noble friendship from the others. And yet such a noble friendship remains all but impossible within a solely technological framework. Centrally, both the formation of virtue and the observation of virtue take time to emerge. For a friendship to develop according to the cultivation of virtue, one must spend time with another for that virtue to manifest. In addition, in stress, we our, person's char our, our character is routinely exposed, and yet it is precisely su such negative realities that new media suppresses. And this suppression occurs not because it is intentionally censored, but because the sort of stress which reveals character is likely unintended and unexpected. And so the sorts of narratives posted in new media have already been encountered, processed, and sanitized of unwelcome extremes. All is judged and weighed according to what the user wishes others to see. In contrast, the revelation of true virtue occurs in those immediate moments where one's truest self rises to the surface. And this sort of presence can only occur concurrently with an investment of time. The second aspect of friendship's resistance to the technological reduction lies in compassion. To suffer with another for another's good provides a powerful counter both to some classical iterations of friendship and to the technological instinct. And yet its power belies its simplicity. To be with another in suffering is to be silent. It is to be present with another in the depth of their pain. Though this commitment to presence may seem obvious, against the backdrop of, a of the larger Western traditions, it has been uh, neglected. No less than Plato located friendship problematically in the need of the person seeking it. And this is a quote from Plato. In actual fact, then, desire is the cause of friendship. As we were saying a moment ago, a person feeling desire, desire is a friend to what he desires for as long as he desires it, end quote. And indeed, this sentiment should appeal. One routinely appreciates in others traits which they do not themselves possess. Yet it remains equally evident friendship is not solely the satisfaction of lack. Or to be sated is not to have friends. Indeed, friendship means obligation as much as it means satisfaction. While one may benefit from friends, friends equally place a burden of responsibility on the self. In addition, this burden is felt not in the abstract, but in the concrete proximity to the friend. That is, one finds themselves bound in the very real presence of the concrete friend. The weight of this description becomes clear when contrasted against the distinctively technological paradigm centered around categorization and classification. The technological friendship receives its identity not from experience or presence, but clear definition. These definitions are often binary and clearly delimited. One is a friend, single, in a relationship, it's complicated, and so forth. The online individual becomes the sum of these identifiers. And consequently, the online personage represents the height of the much maligned Western obsession with mind over body. Tied together only by loose social contract, contracts, these technological avatars intersect only intermittently through the exchange of sign and information. And the resulting relationships bear little of the substance classically associated with friendship. If compassion or the willingness, to, uh, the willingness and ability to suffer with another characterizes genuine friendship, then concrete presence imbues compassion with its weight. Key to presence is the practice of silence. To listen alone to another constitutes presence. It denotes a clearing of space for another to enter our world. More specifically, listening represents an invitation to enter into another person's world. 
And yet even here, invitation threads to turn to assertion, listening into speech. The impulse to speak into circumstance or person appears overwhelming when a gulf between persons is felt. And this is all the more true when the friend suffers. And thus silence in the presence of the other comprises one of the highest expressions of friendship. Nicholas Wolterstorff's son died in a tragic climbing accident at 25. Uh, and this is, he details this in his book, Lament for a Son. In his heartbreaking reflections, he begs, quote, if you think your task as comforter is to tell me that really, all things considered, it's not so bad. You do not sit with me in my grief, but place yourself off in the distance away from me. Over there, you are no help. What I need from you is to recognize how painful it is. I need to hear from you that you are with me in my desperation. To comfort me, you have to come close. Come sit beside me on my morning bench, end quote. Compassionate silence with the friend means to endure. And it is not pity for the friend, since one can pity from afar. And indeed, the concept of pity evokes images of both tragedy and class distinction. While Greek tragedy follows from undeserved suffering, which elicits pity, Roman benefaction often originates from the pity felt towards inferiors, uh, and then a concomitant self a concomitant self glorification for caring about one's inferiors. Yet in neither circumstances pity bind one to another; rather, in pity, the object is oneself. Fear of what may befall one, as in Aristotelian tragedy, or in one's own glory as in Roman munificence. Compassion, by contrast, entails the visceral endurance of that desperation to which Walter Storff refers. This highlights the nature of the profound disappointment expressed in Christ's words to the disciples in Gethsemane, which is all too appropriate today. Could you not stay awake one hour? The disciples' failure is not in the words they did or did not speak, but in their simple absence. For new media, however, silence is impossible. Indeed, new media itself contends against silence, since to participate in social media is to speak. Even apart from posting content, the social media consumer forms opinions because that is precisely what the social media framework encourages. Speech is contribution, even prior to thought, and silence becomes problematic, if not evil. Given this reality, it should come as little surprise that social media drives extreme, drives extreme opinions. It does not matter what one posts, it simply matters that one posts. Yet in the death of silence, of being with another, dies friendship. Commitment to truthfulness serves as the third and final aspect of friendship which resists this technological framework. As worship extends oneself toward a community of others, so genuine friendship leads one into greater truthfulness with others. Indeed, this commitment to truthfulness separates Christian friendship from Aristotle's noble friendship. While Aristotle's noble friendship emphasizes the friend's virtue, Christian friendship emphasizes ultimately the friend's love of God. The Christian friendship thus genuinely shares a telos from which the particular love of the friend derives. The common objection to Aristotle's account that the noble friendship is actually individualistic insofar as one loves the friend, not for themselves, but for their virtue, does not undermine the Christian friendship. For the Christian friendship, the love of the friend, through the concept of the neighbor, exists simultaneously with the love of God. That is, there is no love of God without a love of concrete human others. Moreover, since this love of others must be inclusive as a proleptic caritas, expressed in the eschatological kingdom of God, it participates in a non-scarce economy of love. In this abundant economy of relations, the addition of others into the friendship economy only improves the friendship. And critically for this point, the invitation of others into this economy benefits all, the growing kingdom, the friend, and the self. Uh, by way of clarification, uh, and this is clarified in the notes if you have access to the paper. Um, all I mean here is that uh, the more that join in to a friendship community, the better all are. Um, and this is decisively different from the possessiveness of even the Aristotelian noble friendship. Yet all such friendships find their mooring in Christ as both the representative human being and the truth. 
the essence of friendship can only be sent be seen through Christ. Significantly, this concern is not for a kind of propositional truthfulness, as though Christian friendship finds its foundation in justifiable claims. Rather, it is the performance of truth, of the complete human life, that anchors Christian friendship. The truthful performance of a life centers around the faithful living out of a calling, of being who one is meant to be. Oliver Davies puts it thusly, the deepest truth of the incarnation itself, therefore, is precisely God's coming into visibility, which is communicated to us not primarily in a set of beliefs or doctrines for all of the importance of these, but most foundationally in God's personal coming into relation with us through Jesus Christ, who still speaks in and with his community, the people of God, the body of Christ today, end quote. As Davis suggests, many truths regarding states of affairs, dogmatic assertions, and doctrines are true, but they get their truth from the truth, the Christ in whom all fullness and relationality dwells. This does not sanctify all relational impulses, but rather disciplines those impulses in the light of Christ's embodiment of truth. Under such discipline, with the willing embrace of oneself in Christ, the possibility of redemption occurs, and indeed it is promised. This concern for truth animates the gospel narratives wherein Jesus condemns hypocrisy, since hypocrisy represents the willing denial and abdication of one's calling, leading to despair. And yet hypocrisy all too often partners with self-deceit. Human beings mask their motivations and, our, and desires, even to themselves, to avoid the depravity and the despair that we invite into our lives. Given the depth of human sin and an immense cap capacity for self-deception, it should not surprise that even the most noble human ends and activities are often more frail than they appear. And in a technological world of allegedly greater transparency than ever before, human beings regularly fall short of their proclaimed and posted ideal. And yet precisely here does Christian friendship promise hope. For one hopes that in the service of Christ, friends will tell one the truth. Through the power of Though the power of self-deceit, self-justification, or hypocrisy may disguise one's motivations from our, themselves, friends apart from oneself may skillfully speak the truth of Christ in, into the truth of one's own life. The friend who knows can speak to another, hope for another, and will the good for another, that in the end they may become more who Christ calls them to be. And so here again, Christian friendship departs from Aristotle. There is no virtue apart from shared, the shared good of Christ, nor is there any extrinsic benefit from a friendship predicated on truth. Indeed, like Christ's own life, the truth may even scandalize. In a technological context motivated by versions of utility and power, truthfulness fades. Truth-telling can be tremendously inefficient and isolating, especially if others love their self-narratives more than the truth itself. And this is equally true within friendships. And yet good friendships are both difficult to find and promote and promote significant interpersonal investment. Consequently, a friendship which has endured will also generate ever greater truth-telling power, since neither party wishes the friendship to end. The friend who speaks difficult truth speaks it because they love one enough to tell them the truth, even despite the pain it may cause. Conversely, where truthfulness fades, so follows Christian friendship, since to abandon truthfulness is for the Christian friendship abandonment of its mooring in Christ. Friendships then become little more than Aristotle's friendships of pleasure and utility, and as such, they become particularly susceptible to the technological allure of efficiency, power, and convenience. Rather than the conforming to Christ by regarding others as better than oneself, such friendships become self-aggrandizing. And one need look no further than Aristotle's own brief synopsis of the inferior friendships to see their correlation with technological friendships today. Quote, Therefore, those who love for the sake of utility love for the sake of what is good for themselves. And those who love for the sake of pleasure do so for the sake of pleasure for themselves. And not insofar as the other is the person loved, but insofar as he is useful and pleasant. Such friendships then are easily dissolved if the parties do not remain like themselves. For if one party is no longer present or useful, the other ceases to love him. End quote. 
In an age where being online means receiving targeted ads based on preference, having others suggested as potential friends or colleagues, and being able to resist everything and everyone which one does not wish to see, the idea of friendship which is inconvenient, inefficient, and truthful may fail to inspire. And yet is precisely the space where a true human being can be yet be found. So our conclusion. People, for good reason, love both the wealth their work provides them and the technological innovation which gives them something to buy. And indeed, the Western world enjoys safety unprecedented in history. People have greater self-determination than ever before, and these are clear goods for many people. It is thus understandable why the prospective future growth of technological innovation so arouses its advocates. As the extreme end of such optimism, something like transhumanism promises ever more of such goods. And yet ample evidence from the Western technological trajectory suggests that such optimism follows from utopian thinking and a poor anthropology. And this is nowhere more clear than in the realm of work. Whereas once work was, pred was predicted to be a necessary evil for subsistence, the embrace of work in modernity suggests otherwise. People love their work, or at least people give themselves over to their work in ways and in scale different from the rest of history. This is in part because the work of the world of total work described by Pieper correlates with the technological reduction of life. That is, the world of total work privileges the absolute efficiency of utility. And for those who do not love their work, utility demands that they only commit the absolute minimum to their work. And yet they too remain locked in the total work paradigm of either work or idleness. There is no evaluation of one's ends as long as one is working or playing hard and seeking whatever end at breakneck pace. Such commitments naturally incline towards technological innovation, since in the realm of utility, such innovation allows for more work or play within the set timeline of a day. And yet human beings were not made for such lives. Pursuing such a course comes at a severe cost to body, mind, and spirit. And moreover, as the technological reduction funding the world of total work grows, humankind becomes unable to think or to do otherwise. Existence becomes impossible outside of a world of total work. And yet friendship stands as one location of resistance to this ultimately dystopian world. In friendship, one finds space to simply be with another, to leisure and to enjoy the world given to human beings. And this enjoyment is ultimately evangelical. It grows to accommodate any who wish to join and so in no way exist exclusively for oneself. And so for the Christian, such friendship serves as a place of compassion and truthfulness, both of which are inefficiencies within a technological framework. And yet some will examine the world of total work and its concomitant technological reduction and decide that leisure and specifically friendship are ultimately worth the price. Thank you.